there are good things that have come from this administration and this Congress. Uh, certainly the Chips and Science Act, infrastructure investment, many of the policy provisions of the IRA. But uh, to the point that, uh, that you just made, we are very concerned about the onslaught of regulations that are coming down that are going to drive up the cost of doing business in the United States. Hello and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David J. Lynch, global economics correspondent here at The Post. Today we have two segments on American manufacturing and the emerging workforce. Later, we'll hear from the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Valerie Shears Ashby. But first, I'm joined by Jay Timmons, the president and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers. Jay, welcome to Washington Post Live. Great to be here, David. Thanks for having me. Well, we're glad you could join us. So let, let's set the stage for uh, how things look in manufacturing. The, the number of factory jobs uh, is up almost 800,000 uh, since President Biden took office. As a percentage of total employment, however, it's about flat. Uh, but spending on new factories has shot through the roof. It's roughly double what it was uh, three years ago. So what's your assessment of the overall health of the American manufacturing sector right now. So David, I would say we're, you know, look, we're we're very strong right now. There's no question about it. I think it's important to put this into a um, in, into a historic perspective if you if you will. Uh, I think back to the work that President Bush 43 and even before him Clinton and Bush 41 and and Reagan uh, and then President Obama, the work that they did to expand our trade agreements so that we could sell more products overseas. Um, I think of the investments uh, that were made during the Trump administration because of those just record uh, tax uh, reforms that were put in place, as well as the uh, regulatory certainty. And then, of course, you fast forward to this administration and you look at the investments that were made through the president's manufacturing strategy in terms of infrastructure investment, the Chips and Science Act, and many provisions of the IRA. All of that has led to a, to a place today where manufacturing is stronger than we've seen it in more than a generation. And in fact, you referenced the number of manufacturing workers that are out there today. It's the highest number since 2008. The sector is seeing record uh, investment in new plants and equipment, and you've also seen record wage growth. That's all because of these policies that were put in place by administrations of different political stripes. Now our challenge is to maintain uh, this momentum that we have and ensure that America continues to lead the world economically and certainly leads the world through manufacturing prowess. Well, that's a, a perfect segue into a question from one of our viewers. Uh, Anthony Vance from Washington, D.C. asks, is the surge in manufacturing a temporary phenomenon largely stimulated by government policies instituted in the last three years, or is it likely to remain with us for a decade or so? Well, I guess the answer to that is um, yes to both of those questions, Anthony, uh, depending on what public policies are put into place. Um, I, I mentioned this continuum that we've seen, this, this, this focus by both political parties, which, which is great, uh, on growing the manufacturing economy here in the United States and making manufacturing even stronger. But we have some choices to make. We're at a crossroads. There's no question about that. And those choices, they all relate back to all of those issues that I've mentioned. And I would add one other, which I'll get to in a second. But you have tax policy that has expired in terms of our ability to um, really prioritize innovation through the research and development tax deduction, uh, interest deductibility, and immediate expensing. Those three things alone contribute to a significant amount of manufacturing investment here in the United States. And, it, and the fact that that has um, ceased to exist in the last couple of years, and we're waiting for Congress to renew those incentives, it's chilling future manufacturing investment or current and future manufacturing investment. Then you have the tax uh, reforms of 2017 that are up for uh, discussion and, and action in 2025. 
And those are specifically the, the uh, rates for small and medium-sized manufacturers who file as S-corporations. Those rates expire at the end of 2025. And what I fear is that there will be politicians, probably of both political stripes, who are trying to appease a very important part of their constituency and a very important part of the manufacturing economy, small businesses, by saying, well, why don't we just, why don't we just capitulate on the C corporate and raise that a few percentage points so that we can keep the, uh, the rate low for small and medium manufacturers. And, and I say that is a losing strategy. You've got to have competitive rates across the board. And right now we're at 21% at the C Corp level. Uh, we need to maintain that. We also have to get, and, and in the promo video or the initial video, David, that you ran, it said that I argued against, I'm um, arguing against uh, additional regulation. That's not quite accurate. I'm, I'm arguing actually for smart regulation. And that means business and government sitting down together to talk about what the possibilities are. We all agree on what the issues are before us, whether it's whether it's lowering uh, carbon intensity um, or making sure that our drinking water is safe and our air is cleaner and our communities are healthier for our children and our grandchildren. But you can't just be aspirational about what your objectives are. You have to be very pragmatic and level-headed and you have to understand what is possible in, uh, in, in the world today, as well as what will be possible in the world tomorrow. And then that goes right back to those incentives like the research and development tax deduction. If you want to innovate here in America, you've got to have all of those tools. I would also add that it's important to have trade agreements. We haven't negotiated one for over 10 years. And then lastly, I would say it's extraordinarily important, Anthony, that we have the workforce um, that we need to, to fill the jobs that are open. We have almost 600,000 open jobs in manufacturing today. We're doing really well, but by the year 2033, we're going to need to fill 3.8 million jobs in our sector because of retirements or growth in our sector. And if things keep going the way they are, it's going to be about 1.9 million of those jobs that we can't fill. That's not sustainable. That doesn't right. allow us to be Let, the leader in the world. I, I want to uh, I want to talk about uh, the administration's uh, industrial policies, which are at least in part, uh, in good part, probably responsible for some of this manufacturing uptick, which is the good news. No question. Uh, but this sort of government directed uh, steering of the economy or steering of capital represents a big change from the market oriented policies that we've seen. Uh, in recent decades. Are you uncomfortable at all with the notion of government getting bigger and more involved in the economy? So I don't think there's any pure system when it comes to a free market economy, David. I think, you know, I think you have to be, again, pragmatic. The fact is that China, uh, sure, they're an economic competitor. And, you know, we can, we can deal with that if we were dealing with a level playing field and they were truly a free market economy, but they're not. They're a command economy. Um, they manipulate they manipulate markets, they manipulate um, how products are, are made. But even more important than that uh, is our national security interests. So for instance, Chips and Science, that legislation that passed that provided billions of dollars of grants to, to incentivize uh, chip fab facilities being built here in the United States, that was absolutely critical for our national security. We could not allow these devices to be made in the country where we may not always have uh, the ability to have decent relations. So we're, I, I was pleased from a national security perspective that we invested there, but it also adds to our economic security because everything today, um, as, as we all know, has some sort of an electronic component or a chip um, in, its, in its manufacturer, in its, in its body. Uh, so we have to have that capability here as well as uh, some of the other investments I think that have been really important for ensuring our, our worldwide uh, mantle of leadership. Now, many of these industrial uh, policy projects that the administration's promoting are in the clean energy space uh, aimed at addressing uh, climate change. Many of them are located, as you know, in so-called red states uh, where uh, Republican lawmakers often have voted against the legislation uh, that has uh, created the projects in the first place. So what do you think uh, 
is the likelihood that that kind of work, that kind of funding would survive a change in administrations? Well, to the best of my understanding, uh, a lot of this, uh, a lot of these grants and loans are going to be um, moving very quickly. They're, the administration is trying to move them through the process and very quickly. Uh, but, you know, I'd like to take the politics maybe out of some of some of these discussions. Yes, there are philosophical disagreements on how um, how we're enacting some of these policies that are part of the president's manufacturing strategy. But ultimately, we all have the same goal. And the same goal is for the United States to be the leader, uh, for the United States to grow its manufacturing base, and for the United States to be able to increase the number of workers in the manufacturing sector, because quite frankly, uh, manufacturing has led to a stronger and healthier quality of life and economic uh, status uh, for Americans uh, all across the board. And politicians of both parties understand that. They might look at things a little bit differently, right? So you may see, you may see uh, some some elected officials say, "Well, let's let's have a program where we can spend money," and you might have others say, "Well, let's have a program where you can incentivize through tax policy." I think either of those can work, and we could debate all day about which one is is more effective or which one is more free market oriented. But ultimately, we all want to get to the same objective. You mentioned earlier the need for smart regulation. Uh, I'd be interested if you could provide sort of your favorite example of a grossly misguided regulation that would that puts burdens on your members that would strike the audience as uh, almost ludicrous. Not something that's a minor irritant that might take just a little bit more paperwork, but something that you think is just obviously counterproductive uh, and uh, ought to be eliminated. Well, you want to make this really dramatic, it seems. <laughs> so no, I, 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 I want to. I, I want to give. I'm, I'm giving you a chance to, yeah, uh, to help explain to, to uh, viewers uh, uh, what changes you need to see. Yeah, let me, let me start with a positive because I think I think, and, and then I'll get to the specific regulation that answers your your question. Um, on the positive side, I can point to the Securities and Exchange Commission and their work about two years ago to introduce a, a climate um, emissions regulation um, that was going to be imposed on all businesses of all sizes. Um, we had some real concerns with that proposal because in the end, we couldn't comply. There was literally no way to comply with that regulation. This was an example of a regulatory agency regulators and the business community collaborating, talking, uh, discussing what the goals and objectives are from the regulatory side or the regulator side of the aisle and what the possibilities were and the realities were from the business side. And in the end, David, the SEC literally addressed every single thing that we said was, uh, was problematic. So that's an example of how you can work together. Now, we don't love that regulation. Let me just be very clear about that. But it's a regulation that I think is is at least achievable and the agency listened. The other side of that is the particulate matter PM 2.5 regulation that was issued by the Environmental Protection Agency, which is, you know, it is, it is onerous for manufacturers and actually is counter to what the president is trying to achieve uh, through his manufacturing strategy. What the PM 2.5 regulation will do, quite simply, is it will shut down the ability of businesses to invest and build new facilities in many communities across this country. It's gonna cause mayors and governors to make a choice between say, building a bridge that might be available um, or might be possible through the infrastructure funding legislation that was passed or having the private sector come in and build a new chips facility. These choices are, are, are going to be, these trade-offs are gonna be uh, present uh, very soon, that, that regulation is now in place. And it's gonna cause a lot of very difficult decisions and it's going to impede growth. It's going to impede the ability of manufacturers who could actually help solve the climate issue uh, to build facilities and innovate and create new products uh, to be a part of the solution. So it's, uh, it's one of those regulations that frankly, just not smart. 
Now, you, you mentioned uh, permitting issues uh, a bit earlier, and that's been a perennial complaint uh, for years. There was some movement, uh, I think, at one point last year. There was a, a brief right. glimmer of hope for improvement uh, that I think faded away. Uh, are you at all optimistic about anything changing uh, in that regard, say, in this calendar year, or is that inevitably something that gets pushed over to a new administration or the next administration? I am always an optimist, and on this, I am really optimistic. And the reason I am, David, is because Republicans and Democrats um, have both indicated, or, or they have all indicated to me that they're very concerned about the permitting process. If you think about it, for, again, from the business perspective, where you want to put that shovel in the ground, but it's taking years for a permit to, to be able to do so, whether that's because of state, um, reg, uh, state agencies or federal agencies, um, and then you have, uh, uh, think about the clean energy investments that the administration is making right now. We, we simply can't get things built because of the lack of, of a streamlined permitting process. And then also think about if we're, if we're talking about our competition with China and China's ability to, to produce and mine critical minerals for many of those uh, uh, batteries and clean energy uh, technologies that, that we're trying to employ here in the United States, but our inability to do so here because it takes 15 years to get a mine permitted, 15 years from now, I, I'm sorry, but China will have the advantage. So we've got to figure out how to make sure that we are protecting safety, we're protecting uh, environmental standards, but moving the process along much more quickly. And I would say also uh, coordinating uh, the various agencies that have to sign off on permits, coordinating their work, so that you have one, um, uh, you know, one timeline rather than say ten timelines, because you have ten agencies that are part of the process. Now, the unemployment rate remains quite low by historical standards. Uh, still, plenty of job openings out there. Uh, what's the labor market look like for your members? Are they having trouble? finding enough workers, and is that going to be a choke point, uh, particularly for some of these projects uh, in, the, in the chip uh, world, where uh, I think some of the efforts out in Arizona by TMSC uh, have already uh, run into snags in terms of the availability of skilled labor? Yeah, it, it is definitely a problem. Uh, as I mentioned, we have almost 600,000 jobs open in our sector. I'm really proud of our industry, though. Uh, because there are, of course, many open jobs throughout the entire economy. I don't know what it is now, eight, nine, 10 million open jobs. Um, but I'm proud of our industry because they took it head on and they are continuing to do so. Not only are they upskilling and training um, the workers that are part of their um, part of their employee base now so that those jobs are future proofed as new new technologies come on board. Um, but they've also invested in in programs to recruit the next generation of manufacturing workers. Here at the NAM, we had a campaign called Creators Wanted. And Creators Wanted went to communities all over the country to inspire young people uh, with a kind of a, a hands-on escape room concept to show them what skills are necessary in manufacturing. And David, you could just see these young people come out beaming and saying, I want to be a part of manufacturing. How can I do this? We went to my hometown of Circleville, Ohio uh, for the Circleville Pumpkin Show. We had thousands of kids going through that experience and coming out and saying, I want a job. And that's really important because in central Ohio, you have two very big investments. You have the Honda and LG battery facility that's being, uh, that's being created in the Mount Sterling area. And then you have the Intel facility that I was happy to attend the groundbreaking of with President Biden. Uh, in the Columbus area. And those two uh, plants alone are going to hire thousands and thousands of people. So we've got an obligation, right, as the, as the uh, industry to take this on, but making sure that we have the right uh, educational tools in place at the local level and having states work with us, which many are doing, to ensure that we have the technical training uh, that's necessary, that's important as well. Well, Jay, I've, I've still got several more questions for you, but unfortunately, we, we are out of time. 
Uh, so thanks for a great conversation. Jay Timmons, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, David. Next up, we'll hear from the president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, Valerie Shears Ashby, right after this. So please stay with us. The future is electrified. As the demand for electric vehicles grows, so does the need for EV infrastructure. That's why the Siemens Foundation is investing $30 million in career training programs, creating an inclusive workforce for the growing American EV charging sector. We're driving towards a clean energy future, and we will secure its success by everyone charging forward, together. Hi, I'm David Utzweiler, CEO of the Siemens Foundation. Last fall, the Siemens Foundation created an EV charging workforce initiative called Everyone Charging Forward. Because the electric vehicle charging sector is experiencing rapid growth, there is and will be for the foreseeable future a significant need for workers in EV manufacturing, installation, and maintenance. What we recognized was a confluence of need and opportunity to draw more people from all backgrounds into this growing industry. And that's really what this initiative is all about, working together with our government, business, labor, philanthropy, and community partners to ensure everyone, especially those from underserved communities, has access to resources that can connect them to clean energy careers. Here with me today is Cheryl Sanford, Director of Workforce Programming Must Careers in Detroit, Michigan, which is developing a career readiness program with a heavy focus on the electrical field. Hi, Cheryl, how are you? I'm doing well, David. Thank you for, for having the conversation today. Absolutely, my pleasure. Cheryl, Must works with the Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Training Program, one of the foundation's partners implementing statewide strategies and local partnerships. Tell us more about EVITPs and MUST's electric fast track program and how it operates. Thank you. I'm really excited about this new initiative in partnership with Siemens. The program is, is really uh, twofold. The purpose of the program is, is twofold. One is to upskill the current electricians with the EVITP training and certification, and that's for electricians that will be working on the EV uh, charging installation projects going on all over the country. The second part of the program, um, and this is, is really something that's new, it's only been piloted in, well, in our experience, we've piloted this program once in Michigan, and that is to provide a work-based learning opportunity for individuals who are thinking maybe they want a career in EV, electrical industry, but lack that hands-on experience. So this is an opportunity to provide career awareness and some of the hands-on experience that we always hear from our contractors, you know, when we're trying to help individuals make, make that connection and get into building trades, especially electrical, they lack the hands-on experience. So this is an opportunity to do that with a 10-week paid work experience component that will um, really take individuals who have had some classroom training and provide them with the kind of work-based work, work -based learning, um, hands-on experience. So they'll get to work alongside journey worker electricians and really decide if, if this is the best fit for them. Cheryl, that's great background. Help us understand the current demographic makeup of the electrical field and the future of the sector? Why the focus on new entrants? Because we know uh, over the foreseeable future that we are going to need more electricians. Based on the historic um, investment in infrastructure in the country, which is, is fantastic, but we know, for example, in the state of Michigan, that between now and 2030, we will need um, approximately 13.5% increase in electricians. In um, North Carolina, which is the other area where we will be piloting the program, the demand is expected to increase up to 17%. And wow. we know, just looking at the, the demographics again in the, in the state of Michigan, when you look at construction overall, less than 6% of the construction apprentices are females. Um, approximately 17% for people of color, and for youth, it's less than 1%. So 
all of this investment provides um, a historic opportunity for us to really expand the pipeline of talent and to be more inclusive and diverse and to do it in a, in a very intentional way. So we want to make sure that we are reaching out to those previously underserved populations to make sure that they are included. And that the fact is that more and more of the uh, skilled electricians are retiring. So according to the National Electrical Contractors Association, approximately 10,000 electricians, this is nationwide, but 10,000 electricians retire every year about 7,000 are coming in. So we, you know, we know that there is a, a gap. And again, that provides an opportunity for programs like the Electric Fast Track to, to fill that need and to reach out to those individuals who probably never thought they could work in this field. They never even thought about it. So with career exploration um, outreach, it just gives us an opportunity to be much more inclusive. Yeah. So, so much urgency in the statistics you give. What are the partnership trends or best practices that you're seeing around the country? What, for example, is necessary and helpful in these types of partnerships uh, in local communities? Well, we know from the, the work that we've done in this space and MUST and EVITP have worked together for a long time working on providing those kind of programming um, opportunities for the building trades industry. and what we've learned is that industry engagement is key. And those partnerships are really key to the successful outcomes of this kind of program. So if we don't have industry at the table, then we're just training for the sake of training. We wanna make sure that every participant who goes through this program will have a successful outcome. Hopefully employment in the industry, um, a registered apprenticeship, and if by chance they decide after 10 weeks of, of working in the electric fast track that this just isn't a good fit for you. Maybe you've decided, you know, you thought you wanted to be an electrician, but you really don't. We have workforce development partners, community-based partners, and this provides an opportunity for us to redirect them back through the system. So, you know, we don't want it to, to be a failure for someone because you decided you don't want to work in the construction industry or in the electrical industry, our our goal is to help those individuals find the occupation that is a better fit for them. That's great, Cheryl. That's a wonderful overview of all of that. And if I had to underline one takeaway from today's discussion, it's the importance of business, labor, and communities coming together to engage and support new and diverse entrants in the clean economy workforce. It's the right thing to do, and it's imperative to the success of our country's decarbonization, economic, and security goals. We simply must ensure participation by everyone in our economy. Cheryl, thank you for being here today and for the insightful conversation. I look forward to our continued partnership. And with that, I'll turn it back to the Washington Post. Thank you. The stakes are too high and the number of students too small. So I need everybody, every institution, right. to really support a diverse group of students in STEM. That is necessary. If everybody does it, we still will not have enough students for the next generation of creators and innovators. This is a, is a national issue. <laughs>
Now, for any of our viewers who may not be familiar uh, with UMBC and its historical role, its traditional role uh, as an enormous pipeline of black graduates in the STEM fields, uh, perhaps you could just take a moment uh, and educate us all. What, in particular, what was the opportunity that attracted you to the school uh, a couple of years ago, and how do you plan to build on its already impressive legacy? Oh, I so appreciate that question. Um, this is the question that energizes me daily. Um, so I'm really proud of UMBC. Um, so for those who may not be familiar, UMBC is located in this Baltimore County area, which is very close to Washington, D.C., obviously. And so we are situated in a place where we have industry around us, we have government agencies around us, where the STEM workforce that they need is just tremendous. And we're also situated, in the, obviously, in the state of Maryland that is very diverse. And so we are a public institution. It is our job to actually educate the Maryland Marylanders first and provide this workforce that is needed. And UMBC has been a leader for decades in this space. We produce, um, we're number one in the production of black undergraduates in the fields of the life sciences, mathematics, and computer science combined. Um, that's quite a, a, a feat uh, for us. And we produce these students and they go on to do amazing things, not only in the state of Maryland, but all over the country. We're also the number one producer of black graduates who go on to get MD, PhD. So now they are scholar researchers in medicine. And so we're really proud of that. That has been our history. And I would just note that the goal is just to produce excellent scholars. And it turns out that when you actually have a goal of producing excellent scholars, you become more inclusive. And so for UMBC, part of what we say in our vision statement at the very first, in the very first sentence is that we are not going to call ourselves excellent if we're not inclusive. And so that really then has been the impetus for everything that we do um, for years. Um, and so we have now achieved this status and it has become a part of our culture that we just expect all of our students to be excellent and underrepresented minority students in particular are just thriving in this environment. And, and by the way, that's what drew me here. I am a chemist by training, as you know. Um, so to come to an institution with this history um, and at this moment for our country, to, we really need to continue to do what we're doing. And we not only need us to do it, but we need all of higher education to really take this on um, as a priority. Well, first of all, I, I promise not to ask you any questions about chemistry. That would that would be oh. a, a short, short conversation, at least on this side <laughs> of the camera. If um, I had a board, I'd draw some organic chemistry formulas behind me, but uh, okay, not this time. <laughs> not this time. So black students in general, of course, are, are underrepresented in the sciences, but not at your institution. So what, yeah. what's your secret? What should other universities be doing that they're not doing if they wanted to replicate your success? So, you know, we can look back and really understand um, and learn, um, you know, some best practices that aren't rocket science, which that's the good news. It's not rocket science. Literally, anybody who has the desire can do this. And so what we have learned, um, mostly as a start from our Meyerhoff Scholars Program, which is nationally known, is that if you give students the opportunity, you give them the support, you give them a cohort, you give them the encouragement, you give them the opportunity to do research and to see themselves as scientists, then you really have um, given them everything that they need. And, and those students become successful. They get the highest grades in our courses. Um, they go on to do internships and great research, and they go on to get PhDs and MDs and MD PhDs. And so it's about this culture where our expectation is that our students will be successful. And so it is not about um, remedial anything. They're quite capable. The question is, are we giving them all the opportunities and the support in order to be successful in these disciplines? So that's the way we have approached this. But let's talk a little bit about national policy now. I, I don't know if you caught our earlier segment, but we were talking a little bit about the Biden administration's industrial policies, particularly in the area of semiconductors, uh, clean, renewable energies, and the like. What, what's your assessment of the outlook for producing uh, the, the size skilled workforce uh, that we're going to need to make those programs a success? And, and do you see that 
those areas as an opportunity uh, for your future graduates? Without a doubt. These are the areas that we are training our students. It is the basic sciences. It is engineering. It's the social sciences. It's the fullness of a liberal arts education that's rooted in STEM. So absolutely, our students are qualified now and will be qualified for emerging technologies. Um, the other piece to this is that we are very clear about giving our students, I heard in a previous in the previous segment, hands-on opportunities as a part of that preparation. So for example, you were talking to uh, Jay who was uh, mentioning about manufact talking about manufacturing. There we have real digitized manufacturing facilities on this campus where students can now understand cybersecurity threats in relationship to digitized manufacturing. And not only that, we are upscaling those who are actually in the manufacturing fields where these are professionals who come onto our campus and they are allowed to now, they can upskill and um, really understand the connection between cybersecurity and manufacturing. And so it's a combination of tools that we are using uh, to prepare our students. And we absolutely uh, have students that are so well prepared. And the, the question is how many more can we produce? Now, artificial intelligence is obviously a topic that uh, everyone in, in business and government uh, and uh, your neighborhood uh, is talking about these days. And there seem to be broadly two views of it in a, in a labor market context. Uh, Mark Cuban, I saw uh, quoted the other day, saying that the disruption we're going to experience in the next several years will dwarf anything we've seen in past technological uh, changes. Uh, at the same time, David Otter of MIT, who's a very well-known economist who popularized the term China shock uh, in regard to the effect on uh, unskilled labor in this country from the rise of, of China's manufacturing power, uh, he's actually quite optimistic about the effects of AI, says it, it may in fact revitalize the middle class. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. curious what, what your view is uh, as someone who's, who's in the field. What, what, should we be worried about this from a from a labor market standpoint, or is it is it mostly upside? So I, I would have to say to you, first of all, that I am an optimist. And as a scientist, um, new technology does not scare me. Um, and I understand all of the downsides and the possibilities for people who, look, anytime you have new technology, people can use it for, for bad or they can use it for good. Um, and so it's our job to actually train our students um, in order to, so that they will be able to use the technologies uh, for good. So it does not scare me. Um, and also I should just mention that not everybody needs a college degree. Let me just say that. Um, so when we talk about the workforce that's going to be needed, it's going to be a number of college educated students. It's going to be a number of students who have advanced degrees, but it's also going to be people who are going to community colleges or people who have high school diplomas who just have the skill set. Um, so we have an opportunity to have an impact on the education from high school all the way through you know, an advanced terminal degree. And so with that kind of optimism, I'm, I'm confident uh, that we can upskill a workforce that is broad. Um, and also, by the way, I should mention, this is why uh, universities who, that uh, educate their students in a liberal arts fashion are so important, because we will not only teach our students the science, but we will teach them the ethics. And that's critical for what we are talking about, whether you, and by the way, we need to do that in high school and middle school and every other place. Um, but that's why I am optimistic. Um, I see our students, they are brilliant. Um, they want to use this technology for good, and that gives me hope every day. It's. I think that last remark about liberal arts des deserves a moment because I think some people see a, a sharp choice between uh, mm -hmm. what they regard as meaningful, uh, career-focused endeavors like the STEM fields and then liberal arts, which is regarded as some sort of playground uh, of uh, listening to music and going to plays. Uh, but it's really much more than that, isn't it? It's, it's about learning how to think and, and learning where ideas come from uh, and, and learning the, the history uh, even of scientific thought. Yes, without a doubt. And so this is a place where we are not delivering a full education if it is not a full liberal arts and sciences education. It is all of those disciplines that you just mentioned. But just think about any of these scientific fields and think about how you're going to apply that in a community 
where you don't understand their history. You don't understand the challenges. You don't understand the environment. You don't understand the culture. So we can produce all sorts of wonderful technologies, but communities may not adopt them or they may not trust our science if we don't understand how to enter communities and how to engage them as a part of the scientific process. Um, so this is really important. Uh, and let me just throw in a little bit of data because I know sometimes people say, oh, anecdotally, people love a liberal arts education. 92% of my undergraduates walk out of this institution either going into employment or into graduate school. And 93% of them, of my undergraduates who have, with a college degree, finished their four-year degree are, are in disciplines that they studied. And so I just, you know, the, the, the talk about a liberal arts education and music and art and all those things, and that's all you do. And let me just also say, I think it's a little bit of a matter of the mental health and well-being of our entire world. Um, people need a whole life. Um, and a whole life includes music and art and understanding religion and culture and the environment, all of those things. Um, and uh, there's something that happens in communities when people are happy. Um, and so when you just think about just the ways that we don't even know how to have conversations with each other anymore, um, not just about STEM related issues, but about anything. So I, I'm a real fan of a liberal arts and sciences education. I am a chemist, um, but I treasure my religion class and my philosophy class and my writing course and my communications courses. So it, it's a full package. Now, UMBC obviously remains quite affordable, but college colleges across the country are, are under pressure, uh, deservedly so, for rising costs. There's a lot of frustration uh, about uh, tuition bills. And uh, you hear a lot of voices saying, you know, with it being just so expensive, uh, you know, college just isn't worth it uh, anymore. What would you say to those folks, uh, even acknowledging that, you know, college is not necessarily for everybody? Um, but uh, what do you say to folks who, who say it's just gotten way out of hand how expensive it is? So uh, several things. So first, let me say I am delighted uh, to be in the University System of Maryland, which is a public system in the state of Maryland. And our costs in public higher education in the state of Maryland are, you know, relatively reasonable um, compared to um, many other institutions across the country. That being said, um, there literally is not a single other game changer uh, in a person's life that's more significant than a college education. It changes our health, it changes our communities, it changes our service, it changes the way we engage the political system, it changes everything that makes a life full. And for people particularly who come from uh, economically challenged backgrounds, there is no greater game changer than a college degree. And so this is critical for us to state. Now, I do appreciate all of the um, talk about how expensive it is. Indeed, it can be. Even at our reasonable cost, it can seem expensive. Therefore, it's incumbent upon us to actually make it more accessible. So whether that's through increased need-based financial aid, or of various types of scholarships, it is important for us to make it available to students. It changes their lives, it changes their families' lives for generations, it changes communities. But it's our job in higher education to make our case. Um, and so to really help families understand the difference maker that this is. Now, the Supreme Court last year severely limited the use of affirmative action and race in college admissions. Uh, how are universities adjusting uh, to this change? Uh, how worried are you that that's going to be a further headwind uh, working against efforts to increase minority representation uh, in the STEM fields in particular? So let me speak just about UMBC and then maybe I can speak about it more broadly. Um, I'm really proud. I go back to your original question of why I decided to come to UMBC and what drew me here. Uh, this is an institution that, again, has understood that if you are not inclusive, you cannot be excellent. So when you think about STEM fields, where we're talking about innovation and creativity, 
you need diverse teams of people from diverse backgrounds, diverse disciplines. Um, all of that is necessary to be as creative and innovative as possible. And so for UMBC, this is not a challenge for us because we are simply looking for excellence. And by doing so, we are actually very inclusive. And so we have a campus that looks like our community, which is a beautiful thing. And so for me, this is just rooted in excellence. Um, if we don't have uh, multiple perspectives at the table and in the creation process and in the problem solving process and the solution making process, then we cannot be excellent. So for us, it is not a challenge. Uh, if you walk across our campus, it looks like our community. It looks like the world. Um, and because of that, students are getting a phenomenal education. Now, if you were actually using quotas to just check the box to say that we have some diversity on our campus, you have a problem because now you have to decide how serious are you about that and do you really think you can be excellent without it? Now, that's a, I'm glad that's not our question. It is not. Um, but for universities and maybe some other institutions where it wasn't a priority because you didn't really believe that excellence equal diversity or diversity equal to excellence. Now this is a challenge. And so you know, I, I would say that my students who sit in a classroom, whether it's in the social sciences or humanities or natural sciences, and they sit in that classroom with a diverse group of students to discuss hard, challenging topics, they are receiving a world-class education. And so it's a challenge for us in higher education to decide can, do we really believe you can be excellent without diversity or not? And at UMBC, that's not our question. Well, I think that's a, a great place to end on. Uh, Valerie Shears Ashby, thanks so much for joining us today on Washington Post Live. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of you for joining us as well. Uh, for more of the important conversations that we have here at the Washington Post, uh, please do sign up for a free subscription to what we used to call the newspaper. Uh, for a free trial, please visit WashingtonPost.com backslash live. That's WashingtonPost.com backslash live. I'm David, David J. Lynch. Thanks for joining us.